Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze. In this video, we're going to review an entry-level beginner telescope that I've wanted to test for quite some time. This box contains the Celestron Inspire 100AZ Refractor Telescope. Now, I am not affiliated with Celestron Telescopes, although they did purchase several thousand copies of my book, 50 Things to See on the Moon, for the Apollo 50th celebration, and that was pretty darn cool. But I'm here to answer one simple question. Is the Celestron Inspire 100AZ the perfect beginner telescope at an entry-level price? Let's find out. This is Learn to Stargaze. So this is October of 2020, and there have been a lot of changes in the telescope market in the past year. Manufacturers seem to be struggling to maintain inventory, and prices on several beginner telescopes have gone up. I'm worried that first-time telescope buyers are purchasing lower quality equipment. This is because many good entry-level beginner telescopes are no longer at entry-level prices. Note that when I say entry-level, I'm talking specifically about price here, telescopes that cost only a few hundred dollars at most. Recently, I've been recommending this telescope to beginners based on the opinions of my friends, having used it but never owned it. I used to recommend beginners start with a Dobsonian telescope. However, Dobsonians typically aren't very portable, and I believe the best telescope is the one that gets used. And based on this telescope size, I'm thinking this telescope might get used more often. So when looking for the optimal beginner telescope at an entry-level price point, there are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, aperture is king or queen. Aperture determines the resolution. It's the diameter of the primary mirror or lens. The best value in aperture is typically a Dodsonian telescope, but this runs against the mantra I just mentioned. If you're not motivated to lug a 50 pound Dodsonian telescope out into the backyard, then what good is all that aperture? Rule number two, the mount is paramount. An entry level telescope should be on a telescope mount, not just a camera tripod. It should easily move up and down and left and right, that's why I prefer alt azimuth mounts for beginners and reserve equatorial mounts like this one for more advanced users. And the mount should be stable enough so that the telescope stays where you put it when you let go. Here's an example of a telescope failing that test through the eyepiece. Rule number three, and this is the most complicated rule, pay attention to the focal ratio with a lower number being preferable. You'll see those long thin telescopes marked F10 or F13 those high focal ratios accomplish a few things. They allow the manufacturer to use lower quality lenses and they allow for high magnification. But it's important to note that magnification is the least important quality of a telescope. In most cases, less magnification is better because with lower magnification, finding targets in space becomes easier. At an entry level price point, this telescope in theory excels at all these points. And that's what I want to test. Note that I am only referring to the Inspire 100 AZ model. There is a 70 AZ and an 80 AZ, but because of those telescopes high focal ratios, the 70 AZ and the 80 AZ are very, very different telescopes. For those in Canada like me, you might call this the 100 AZ telescope. Now I picked this telescope up at Costco for around 300 Canadian dollars. That's just over 200 US dollars. That said, prices for these scopes are changing all the time. And again, I'm not affiliated with Celestron or any retailers, so I can't guarantee that this scope won't be more expensive by the time you're watching this video. But Thanksgiving's coming up and you might actually catch it in one of the Black Friday sales. All right, are you ready to unbox this telescope? Cue time lapse. Okay, this is interesting. It looks like there's instructions right under the cover. Now under the cover are instructions for aligning the finder. I'll cover this later, but I want to point out that this is the most important part of setting up a telescope, making sure you get this step right. Moving on. reminder that this telescope is not designed for solar observing.
All right, so what was in that box? Well, we've got the telescope, which according to the box has a focal length of 660 millimeters and an aperture of 100 millimeters. Note that at 100 millimeters, I actually classify this as a mid-sized telescope, not a small telescope, which means in dark moonless skies, a telescope with 100 millimeters of aperture should be able to observe thousands of targets like those from the Messier and NGC lists. We've got a 20 millimeter eyepiece, and this is the one you should use most often. Now, the way you calculate magnification is by dividing the focal length of the telescope by the focal length of the eyepiece. So in this case, we've got 660 divided by 20, which is 33. There's also a 10 millimeter eyepiece. This is the one you would use to zoom in on a planet. This eyepiece provides 66 times magnification. Now, interestingly, this telescope does not come with a Barlow. A Barlow is a lens you place between the telescope and the eyepiece, which typically either doubles or triples the magnification. I'll be sure to test this telescope with a Barlow and see if I'd recommend purchasing one for this telescope. Now, this telescope comes with a 90 degree image erect diagonal. Now, this is interesting. The difference between this and a regular diagonal is that this flips the image so that objects appear right side up. This is included so that this telescope can be used both for space and terrestrial observations. Less expensive telescopes often only come with a 45 degree angle and you would have to buy the 90 degree angle version if you want to comfortably look at things in space. This telescope comes with a Star Pointer Pro Finder. Honestly, I've never used this before but I love unit power finders like this one that don't magnify the sky. I find that these make it extremely easy to find targets in the sky far easier than with a regular finder scope. Don't forget to insert the battery. I'm going to do that right now. The telescope also comes with this little thing, which they're calling a screwdriver. The first use I can find for this is for removing the battery port on the finder scope. It uses a 2032 three volt battery. Now I must have put the battery in backwards because this is not working. Let's give that another shot. There we go, now it's working. The telescope also comes with a red flashlight that fits through the mount just like that. Now you might think of this as a bit of a gimmick, but actually this was a huge selling point for me. Amateur astronomers should always document their progress and record their observations. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada will actually give you a certificate and pin for free just for doing so. Just Google the RASC's Explore the Universe program for details. A red light like this also helps because when stargazing, it's important not to look at any bright white lights. It's also important not to look at computer screens or even a cell phone. The light from your phone makes it difficult to see dim objects in space like galaxies once you get to the eyepiece. In fact, it's best to spend 20 minutes in the dark without looking at a phone even before attempting to view deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula. That's why amateur astronomers recommend using a guidebook like 50 Things to See with a Telescope, which has star maps that can be read under the red light. Speaking of cell phones, this telescope does come with a cell phone adapter. It's actually built right into the lens cap. You would then slide your cell phone under these little bungee cords just like this. I might give this a shot, but really for about $10, there might be much better ones out there. That said, I love taking pictures of the planets and the moon with my iPhone. The telescope also claims to come with astronomy software, and I assume that's a free download. But astronomy software is pretty much free anyway. My favorite astronomy program is called Stellarium, and I have several videos on how to use it. The telescope also comes with a Vixen style mounting plate, which means that this telescope can also be mounted on almost any other telescope mount. Okay, let's put it together. Cue another time lapse. So first impressions. Well, this looks like a really hardy scope. I really like the accessory tray, which seems to come in handy and it actually folds up with the scope. The mat has a little bit of play to it, but I think that's because I'm using it on a hardwood floor and not, well, the ground. Now this is a panhandle mount, which means you twist clockwise to lock the mount and counterclockwise to loosen it. What I like to do is keep it fairly loose and then balance the telescope so that when you let go, it stays where it is, even with a loose axis. You balance the telescope by loosening the panhandle all the way so that the telescope moves freely. And then it's balanced when the telescope stays exactly where you put it and then tighten these knobs again. Also, I often move the telescope by pushing on the scope itself, not necessarily using any given handles. 
So the idea is you set the tension on this once and then leave it alone. I'll have to test that to see if it works out when I'm actually using the telescope to view the night sky. Now for the finder, I can turn this on and you adjust the brightness with the knob and it is quite bright. I would almost use this at half brightness when looking for deep sky objects and maybe only full brightness if you're looking for the moon or the planets. Now make sure you have extra batteries for the finder because if you accidentally leave it on and the batteries run out, you'll be effectively left without a finder and you'll probably lose an entire night of stargazing. All right, now I guess it's time to take the telescope outside and align the telescope with the finder. Now for the most important part of setting up a telescope. You need to make sure that the finder and the telescope are pointed at exactly the same spot. This is much easier to do during the day, but it can also be done by pointing the telescope at a bright star. So for me, I always do this without my glasses on so they don't get in the way, and I also focus the telescope to match my prescription. Oh, look who's here, come on, come on. I'm gonna start by trying to point the finder scope at a distant chimney. If you can't quite see the bullseye, you can run your hand in front of the finder like this. Now my job is to get the telescope pointed at that spot. I'm gonna focus the telescope at the same time. Here we have the telescope focused on the chimney. Now that the telescope is in focus and pointed exactly at that chimney, I'm gonna move back to the finder scope and adjust these two knobs, this one here, and this one here until the finder scope is pointed exactly at that chimney. So let's do that now. This knob at the front moves the finder left and right. This knob at the back moves the finder up and down. Now by alternating my view back and forth between the finder and the eyepiece a few times, I can confirm that the telescope and the finder scope are pointed at exactly the same spot. So here's a few other tips and tricks. You generally do not want to set up a telescope on a wooden deck like this. The vibrations will travel through the tripod and make the image quite shaky. If you're stargazing alone, it really helps to stargaze from a chair and then adjust the height of the tripod accordingly. Also dress warm, but most importantly, have fun. And after you've found something cool, be sure to share it with your family and friends. Now for the real test. Does this impress my kids? Is that cool? Yeah, Jupiter. One tiny Jupiter. And how many moons? Can you count them? One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I think there's just four there, buddy. One, two, three, four. We are going to dark skies. Where are we going, Isaac? To Isaac's To Isaac's Harbor. So we're going to bring this telescope and test it out under the darkest skies in Nova Scotia. And we are so excited. All right, Isaac, are you ready to see some dark skies? Yeah. All right, we got our dog, we got our bags packed, we got a telescope. Let's do this. All right, high five. So here we are in Isaac's Harbor, Nova Scotia, and it is pretty dark. So here's the camera pointed at the sky. This is uh, the Pleiades star cluster right here, and this is just on the iPhone, and I'm able to set the exposure uh, in ISO. So this is ISO uh, 5120 and about a one-tenth of a second exposure. And so what I'm hopefully going to do tonight is just go from sort of star cluster to star cluster and see what I can see with the Celestron Inspire 100AZ telescope on the iPhone uh, with these camera settings. This is the uh, iPhone 11, and... Um, just go from here and let's uh, hop over to another one here. This is part of the double cluster just below Cassiopeia here in the Northern Hemisphere. Here we have the Dragonfly cluster that's NGC 457 right in the center there. Looks great. Not super reminiscent of what it looks like with the human eye. It looks more like a big smudge in this area. Um, with that telescope, but this is kind of neat. You can definitely see the bright core of the galaxy here in the iPhone video. There's the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules. It's M13. Um, and this is about what Saturn looks like through this telescope. Your eye will pick it up a little bit clearer. It was kind of hard to get focus on the telescope, uh, on the iPhone rather, um, but yeah. Been out for, you know, an hour and a half or so. You can see 
the dust or the dew collecting on the telescope here. And I think we're completely dewed up. Uh, let's see how the, actually the lens is pretty clear. Uh, and so this dew shield is doing its job. All in all, every target I looked at, I was able to find. We are um, only using about a 20 millimeter eyepiece in here. So the ring nebula was a little small. Um, I was able to pick it out. So the cell phone adapter I used to take some of these videos. This is uh, a little better than the one that comes with the scope. This is the Celestron Next YZ. Um, and so my cell phone just clips in here quite easily. And then it allows us to go up and down and left and right just to get to frame that shot um, as, as best you can. And so um, too bad my kids uh, were too sleepy to join me out here tonight. But, uh, you know, it, it works great. Uh, some things that could be improved. The telescope, if we just try to move it left and right, it sort of lifts itself off the ground. And so I'm wondering if I need to either loosen this axis somehow or add some WD-40 because it's a little stiff. Up and down isn't bad. Um, the focuser, I guess because the dew, uh, it was a bit squeaky at first. Um, could use some grease. Um, but besides that, telescopes worked quite well. You can see that our reticule is all fogged up. So that concludes my review of the Celestron Inspire 100 AZ telescope. If you can get this around $200 that's a heck of a deal, and it does make a great entry-level beginner telescope that you could probably have a lot of fun with for years and years. Hey everyone, John Reed here again. I hope you enjoyed this review of the Celestron Inspire 100 AZ telescope. If you're new to astronomy, I highly recommend you watch my Homeschool Astronomy Challenge series, which is available on this channel, Learn to Stargaze. Please subscribe so you don't miss any new videos. And I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Learn to Stargaze. And remember, the future is looking up.